I wonder if we've ever done any comparison of the multiple AIs uh, transcription and see who's really doing better. Well, I, we have not done that for the calls. I bet somebody's done that for something. They've, they've I got bet it. they've done that, you know, because yeah. I, I really like Otter and I have other people really swear by, you know, other things. Uh, Whisper is one you can download and install models on your computer and it's actually really good as well. Yeah, I like what I have and see no reason to change or even think about it. <laughs> so, uh, Doug, go ahead. You're muted. There we go. I, I, have, I have a question. Yes. If, if I'm writing an essay and I go to chat for a couple of paragraphs <coughs> and I do that, and the next day somebody says, what did you mean by that? And I have no idea because I didn't write it. How come this problem isn't happening more frequently? Maybe they read what they publish before they publish. Yeah, but... You know, people are not, they're just going to stick the paragraph in because it feels good. But Doug, we've had this problem for decades. We've always we had research assistants that we hand over the pen to. <laughs> they write two or three paragraphs on something we didn't want to waste our time on. And we quickly look to make sure that the spelling is right. I think decades <laughs> is short for that. I think it's centuries we've had that problem. Right. That's probably true. Very true. I mean, Doug, if you think people are just not going to have responsibility for what they publish, meaning they won't read at all the things they put out under their name, then we have a whole different society. Right. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern sent memos back, you know. Well, given, the, given, the, given the crisis and failure to replicate in the research community, which has often been traced back to the heads of laboratories just signing their name to the work of the people in their lab this is not this is not a new problem uh -huh. the problem is we don't pay people enough unless they are a lab director overseeing 20 people it's just ridiculous hmm. uh, this is the open global mind weekly call on thursday april 4th 2024 uh, we made it through April Fool's Day without any major kerfluffles, apparently. I, I missed, did Apple put out a an Apple an April Fool's thing this year? They, all, they usually do something, or no, like Google usually Google, does something. Google usually yeah. does. <clears throat> I missed it somehow this year. Ah. Gmail was launched on April Fool's Day. Isn't the world already April Fool's? <laughs> but no. far the best tweet of the day was, it's April Fool's Day. The one day of the year when you're not supposed to believe what you see on the internet. Yeah, that's <laughs> funny. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Would, I saw similar memes to that. <laughs> Diana. Uh, uh, so it's, it's seen a quote attributed to Murray Gell-Mann and stuff. Uh, Our education system hasn't adapted to the invention of the printing press. We have Dutiful scribes creating <laughs> creating a new <laughs> copy of the. Yep. I went to Caltech and that was a meme that was universal. I mean, all the faculty said that because they didn't yeah. want to teach. <laughs> Gordon McCormick doesn't go far to find his fix. It just finds me, I guess. If you heard that audio that was on my side because a video that was sitting in an article about fentanyl in, P in Portland just started playing. How about that? Weird. I was like, what, what is that? What's happening? Ah, You guys are one of the fentanyl capitals of the country, right? Uh, yeah. About 15, I, I think. But I, I think the unreckoned, the unreckoned wrecking ball that, that ran through here was, was fentanyl. Uh, and that mm. plus measure 110 uh, was a lethal combo that did not help anything. What measure is measure 110? Measure 110, uh, three years ago, Oregon voted to decriminalize drugs <clears throat> and mm. then proceeded to not put in place any of the social services that are actually essential for any measure like that to ever succeed. And so, um, and so over this last year, they've had a big uh, reckoning and uh, they, uh, the, the, the governor of the state just passed a measure basically recriminalizing, mostly rolling it all back. Uh, not, enti not entirely. Uh, but it's a it's a big it's a big strike for decriminalization of drug measures wherever because Portland was a pretty good uh, 
poster child. Uh, in fact, uh, Oregon people went and visited um, Portugal and said, oh, what did you do? Uh, and the Portuguese were like, yeah, you have to do these things. And then somehow, magically, uh, the people came back, ran a measure. The measure did not say we're going to stage this in. You know, we're going to, as soon as there are services, then we can release. No, no, no. The, the measure just decriminalized and, and said, hey, police, you can only like give tickets or or whatever. Uh, so crazy. And it was all drugs. I, I believe so. Wow. I believe so. Yeah. So, you know, <clears throat> I hate to see a good idea done badly. You know, me too. That's just... hmm. yeah. Yeah, then you know, it's the interesting that you say charging into battle and then run away. It's interesting that you say that, Kevin, about a good idea going badly, because I often think why that is. And if you think about it, people say, you know, you'll hear these ideas, but who actually gets to implement them? Mm. And how often do they go back to where the source of the ideas came from to get input? Mm. Hmm. That's a favorite trick in Washington. They, they write a half-baked bill. It has the aspirations included, but none of the mechanisms or the funding for achieving them. And then two or three years after the bill has passed, the same people who wrote the bill have a hearing and bash the agency over the head and say, why didn't you do this right? And the agency is always too timid to say, because you wrote a really bad bill that was impossible to implement. Mm, mm. Just, and, and it's getting worse. I mean, the, the yeah. legislative drafting is is no longer a, a, a fine art. It's uh, something that's left to press secretaries. Yeah, I had a friend who was a staffer on the, when they did the earned income tax credit. And he became convinced that the Democrats wanted it to exist and the Republicans wanted it not to work and they both got their way. Yeah. And so he, he left and oh. he actually became the largest uh, microfinance equity fund in the country. That's what he, he went on and did. And he just realized it, 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 the system worked, you know. And okay. dysfunction was, was the end result for, that it was okay with both sides. In the really cynical times, or when I'm really being cynical, I look at what some of these people are doing and it's, it's almost like a poison pill. You know, they put something in there to make sure that the program self-destructs. Yeah. Yeah. When I, I was, I was working for Gore back in the Senate in 1991, we were writing this bill to dramatically expand funding for high performance supercomputers and Richard Gephardt who hated Gore and who had run against Gore for the presidency in 1988 just put in a couple sentences that said, oh, and by the way, every dollar spent in this program must be spent on American hardware and chips. I mean, this is when the Ch Japanese were making some of the best chips. And if you were going to make super, right. if you were going to buy some Japanese chips. Mm -hmm. It was just like, you know, his way of screwing Gore. Luckily, we got mm. to take it out in the middle of the night, but. Mm. That's how the sausage gets made. Yep. Unfortunately. <laughs> so this week we have a check-in format. And last check-in, two weeks ago, we set a challenge for ourselves. And there's sort of two questions I want to ask. The first challenge we set was, hey, why don't we raise the bar a little bit on our check-in so it's not a general purpose check-in, but rather, uh, what did you do last week that made things better? And things is a lovely broad word, but... Um, I think the idea is that made society better in any particular way, uh, human life better in any particular way. And it can be a small bore, it can be large bore, it can be anything you'd like. And the second issue we have on hand is whether and how to use the chat during the check-in portion of the check-in calls, <clears throat> because we sort of can't resist using the chat. I am certainly guilty of wanting to use the chat like crazy and have to resist, have to sort of chew my knuckles uh, during the, the, the check-in portion, I'm exaggerating, but, um, but we did have sort of a loss of chat discipline during the last check-in call. That was, that was like, I, I was, I wound up pondering, do I play stricter list mom or do we just change the rules here? 
uh, as we go. So I'd love to have a short discussion about that before we go into the topic. How y'all feel about using the chat during check-in? Anybody who wants to pipe up. I feel very strongly that it's uh, it prevents good listening. It's not possible to be reading the chat and paying attention to the person who's talking at the same time. And my belief is that conversation stirs up stuff from down below, which requires a different kind of listening. It's not possible if you're reading the chat at the same time. So you I pretty to... much agree with that. In the class I'm doing with my daughter, we were letting people do uh, Zoom in and we realized that we couldn't pay attention to the people in the room. This is act local. So this is like people in our town wanting ben to McCormick look at things they want doesn't to do. Go far to find his... Sorry. Is that your fentanyl again? Yeah. <clears throat> and it, it's, it's, it's spontaneously turning itself on for reasons. Yeah, that Jerry on drugs, whatever. It's on drugs. Anyway, so, so, so we've decided to be the people in the town looking at this issue. And so we, we, which is hard for me. I like to exist, you know, with my iPad and in the room. And it's like, I, it's a discipline. I, mm -hmm. I agree with Doug. I think I can, I really hate it. I really like to dip into chat, but I think it's a good thing for it. I, I will, I will put, I will vote to put my attention on the, the, the people in the room. And the That's way the, vote. and the way the rules sort of stand, the way our <laughs> rules stand in check-in um, is also that we shouldn't be replying to other people checking in. We don't want to start a conversation during check-in. So we violated that a couple of times. Um, we don't, uh, and just because we want to follow up and make sure that some link gets put in, we put them in the chat. We should just hold all chat until the end of the check-in round or the end of the session, because sometimes our check-in runs right to the 90 minutes. And then paste all the note. If you want to take notes on a separate uh, notepad, then plot them all into the chat at one time, and that'll be fine. And we'll get all the links that we want and so forth. But we need to be a little more patient than we've been um, and tolerant if we follow the no chat rules. Does anybody want to argue for releasing the chat? I, I, I three quarters agree with Doug. Um, and, I, and I certainly like the idea that if your only reason to chat is to throw a reference out there or to make sure that the official record includes some paper or podcasts, then that, that makes sense. I, I think in, there is there are occasions when somebody says something and uh, it would make sense for me to send a personal chat. And, and it could be, hey, let's talk about this. I know some people. Um, and, and if I don't do that right away, my uh adhd brain will not allow me to go back and do it later so I, I i guess my my proposed rule is you can post but you can't read so, uh -huh. so, so don't 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 respond to what other people say and try to do what you're doing in a one-to-one -one manner not a blast to the gang that seems difficult to govern but uh kevin well, you don't know. If you send a personal note to uh, to Doug, then you'll never see it. <laughs> sure. What if what if we had instead of bio breaks, we had a digital break every forty five minutes, and then you could post stuff in the chat, and you could be in your digital space when you are. I mean, I think Mike's thing is 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 great. It kind of reminds me of uh, uh, Juliet's response to her nurse when she's going to the. Uh, Ball. She says, I will no more in dart mine eye than thy word gives me leave. And, you know, turns out she she couldn't she couldn't keep it that way. You know, I don't think you can keep your yourself that way. So that's that's what I think. I like, I like, I like, I like that proposal with a 25 minute timeline. <laughs> yeah. How, what's your digital be, drop limit? Yeah, that would probably that would be a, usually we only go for like 50 minutes of check-in. Yeah. Problem with and, a one-on-one and, one chat is that it changes the state of mind of the person receiving it. But not if you don't have chat open. If you you'll still get a notification. After. You yes, read it out. But, but then you require everybody in the group to be reading it to know what's happening. No, Doug, what, what Mike is saying is just don't open your chat at all until the end of check-in time and you won't yeah, notice whatever's there. Yeah, but, unless, but, unless you have a personal, I mean, sometimes it's a personal note. It's, you know, 
hey, Fred, really sorry to hear about that. You know, I have I, I might have some ways to help you or something like that. And I want you to note that there's a mysterious person who's joined us to help with gender balance. And oh, age my balance. God, seriously, she's real. No way. Lizzie's the Lizzie is here. Yay! Much she's better. muted though. <laughs> Yay! I'm eating breakfast, so I'm off video on mute. Awesome! Welcome. So happy to see you. Welcome. Good to see you too. We are we are just getting ready to go into our check in phase where people talk about what's uh, well. Jerry will explain. Yes. Uh, right after yeah. Stuart and Carl go. Yeah, a couple of thoughts. Uh, one, research has revealed that multitasking is a fallacy. Okay, it, it just we, the human mind can't do it. You miss half of each thing. So the idea of, of you know, of chatting while uh, checking in is uh, not a good idea. Second, um, what's brought to mind is um, a great statement by the guy I studied divorce mediation with who opened the program by saying, rules are made for the guidance of wise people and the adherence of fools. Um, <laughs> and so let's not legislate this okay Thank you. <laughs> it, if it's that important you're gonna fucking remember it, it you know it's not gonna it, you you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna remember it i think or write a little note to yourself that's those are my few thoughts on this one <laughs> i like that um, I, I will have to add that I am very skeptical of the uh, multitasking as a fallacy thing, uh, in particular as a facilitator of uh, of events. I'm paying attention to 10 things as an event unfolds. Uh, Ken apparently has an answer to this as well. Uh, you're muted, however. Muted. You're going to have to task the little mute thing. I, I got a great distinction from a book called um, Essentialism, the, the Discipline Pursuit of Less, where he says... It is possible to multitask. We can wash dishes and listen to the NPR at the same time. We can drive and have a conversation with somebody on, on with us. However, multifocusing is not possible. If it requires a focus, it's, it's very, you know, like you're really trying to pay attention, then you can't, you have to be single focused. So, um, and I think people have a tendency to bleed their multitasking into multifocusing, and then they end up not remembering what's going on or not paying attention to what's going on. So that was a distinction I really liked. I just thought I'd offer that out in this conversation. Thank you. Um, that is awesome. Uh, and and uh, Stuart, I think your hand is still up from before. So let me go to Carl. Okay, yeah, I guess... Um... Yeah, there's a book on um, single tasking, I say, but I like that single focus better. I mean, that I've also seen uh, referred to like as meta tasking, but like a chef, how do they have every, like all the dishes you know, get come be ready at the same time kind of thing. So you're like another, um, it takes like 10 minutes for the pot of coffee to brew, what can you be doing in the kitchen for those 10 minutes while it's happening? So that's kind of that um, type of thing. The other thing is, um, can we, um, if there's a notification, do you have to click on it <laughs> and stuff like, so can we, can you get to the, sometimes I don't look at the chat at all and it gets up to like, like there's like 58. <laughs> <laughs> over there but it's I mean it gets to the point where it's overwhelming so then it's um if we can take the chat and just feed it you, know, you can feed it into uh, you know just we can look at it later like you post the chat to um and then one of the other things that's really cool is I've just been looking at the brain 14 it's starting to get into some AI um, capabilities and one of the one of the things that's really cool is it can go through and it will generate a um, a to do list out of and stuff with all. Uh, so, Carl, are you are you checking in? Uh, I guess started started to break in, so that's yeah. Okay, so you sort of swung into it, but also we have a challenge for today's check in, which is we want to be answering as much as we can. What did you do last week that made things better? Which I've put in the chat. So I'm going to propose uh, that we swing into check-in mode. 
and that we honor the no chat. Um, I, I'm I'm going to make the so uh, Mike. I'm going to ask you if you want to DM something to somebody to just make yourself a note that says like DM Stacy about support for the call she was on or whatever. Uh, that just make a note to yourself. Let's hold off on all chat if possible until the until everybody has checked in. Let's not converse during the check in. Let's pay attention in a mindful Quaker meeting ish kind of way. Um, and let's see how that goes. And if we have a rough time doing that, we can talk about it at the beginning of the next check-in in two weeks. But for right now, uh, uh, and also for Lizzie, because you're new here, uh, every, we alternate formats for, for these OGM calls uh, every other week. So next week, we'll have a topic. Uh, and the topics, we sometimes have a funny time funding, but but we, we pick a topic and we go into it salon style. And then every other week, we go around and we um, I will step out, I will step aside and just be a participant until we're done with check-ins, unless there's a little bit of housekeeping that needs to happen. But um, the way to step in is to raise your Zoom hand to form a queue and then to take your time. There's no problem with Quaker-like silence between people stepping in and checking in. And normally our check-ins are about what kind of OGME things are happening in your life. Today, the, the bar is a little higher, which is, you know, what did you do in the last week uh, that made things better? Uh, where what, you know, things and better can be broadly construed, but that's the intention of our, of our call. If all of you will help me enforce the no chat until end of check-in uh, thing, I would appreciate it uh, because I don't want to feel like the, the nasty list mom. <clears throat> um, I think that'll work out just fine. So we've raised the bar on check-ins. Uh, with that, I will um, step aside, mute myself, and see who'd like to step in. Well, I'm always talkative and I'm always doing things. I don't know how much I did this year, this week that was making the world better, but the um, <clears throat> most exciting thing is that we've put out a report on report cards for digital policy. And so we're looking at four countries, Malaysia, Korea, Japan, and the U.S., and in 10 different topics from encryption to cybersecurity to online privacy, we evaluated not the policy, but how the policy is made. And specifically whether the president and the prime minister or one of their appointees is actually pushing the process so they can get something done. And it was a, it, it, we're, the report's been out for about four weeks, but we're now talking to people about it and preparing to do a similar thing for Canada, Taiwan, Singapore, and perhaps India, although that's quite a challenge. Um, but the idea is to tell the world when a country is doing something well um, and to tell the world when they're not doing it so well or when they were doing it well and now they're kind of falling down. Um, we were talking earlier about how the theory is good, often very good from the parliament or the legislature or the White House and the implementation is not always so good. So that's that's uh, yeah, that's been my effort to make the world a little bit better piece by piece. Um, I, I am a flaming optimist when it comes to technology, but a political pessimist. So my, and you've heard that before. So my general approach is meliorism, just a little bit more, just a little better, just work hard and maybe the right thing will happen. And uh, the, the way I usually make things happen is by launching some kind of new way of thinking about a topic. Uh, sometimes it's just a, a buzzword. Sometimes it's just a different way of, of reflecting on a, on a hot topic. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that I'm trying to do to make the world better is just to keep tweeting and posting as much as possible of the very best five sentence reasons to not vote for Trump. I, I just, <laughs> it's my only way of reacting to the cr absolute craziness that this guy is, is, is showing the world. Um, I will, I will try to post the best Venn diagram of the month after the chat opens up again. 
And I, I do want to also say that probably the best thing I did was I, I convinced my daughter Lizzie to join this call. Uh, we've been talking about this call forever. She met Jerry about, uh, it must be 10, it must be 12 years ago. I guess she, she was in, in uh, she was about 14. So it was 12 years ago. And she and a friend joined us for a weekend retreat here in Washington that Jerry organized. And uh, I, I don't know if it had the same impression on Lizzie that it had on me, but uh, I, I think she did come away convinced that there's some really cool people who get to do really cool stuff. <laughs> so, and I'll let her introduce herself when she, when and if she decides to speak up. So uh, that's that's my little bit of goodness, and um, I hope uh, uh, I hope I've been a good model. Well, I guess I'm the only one with my hand raised, so I'll go next. <clears throat> uh, the good thing I did was forward an email. Uh, this was something that came along and in my, before two weeks ago, when I was in charge of content for my, uh, our events business, I would have put it all into place and made, a, made it a big part of the content. As it was, I sent it on to the younger people who are going to be leading it. Uh, and to say, hey, this I think this is really important. This was what I would do, but I, I'm, I haven't thought about it again. Uh, <clears throat> and then I was just on a potential part. We, we've gotten on on the stage to the point where a lot of people want to partner with us, neighborhood economics. And so this guy was saying, what can we do? And, it, and I was on there with one of the younger people who's going to be leading it and me. And I said, you know, my job is to be irresponsible here <clears throat> and yeah, at least creatively irresponsible and imagine all the things we could do without realizing how it would be in the way of what Tim and the other folks are trying to build and, and do. So I was able to imagine a whole lot of things I wasn't able to do when I was had to be uh, uh, building the, the conference two weeks ago. So it's, it's I, I think I'm able to deliver a, a an occasional bout of uh, creative irresponsibility on the front end of any partnership, uh, as long as I don't have to be around to see how it all works. So uh, it, it feels really good to forward things. So that's that's what I did was was stop doing stuff and and uh, let the other folks do it. Thanks. Am I good to jump in? All right. Um, I think I usually wouldn't have uh, anything on, you know, what I've done this week, internet, online wise. I work in, <clears throat> I'm uh, getting my master's in public health and I work as a public health analyst. So most of my stuff is uh, how to improve healthcare outcomes for Americans internationally, generally. Um, but this week I got to participate in a focus group for uh, developing survey questions for an international survey on uh, Americans, not international, sorry, a national survey on Americans' feelings towards telehealth. Um, and so I have gotten to lead focus groups very frequently, but it was uh, really meaningful to be on the other end to, as somebody that has had a lot of experience with telehealth, I used it extensively during the uh, pandemic, but also I've, you know, interviewed a lot of people of varying demographics about their own healthcare needs. So I was able to bring kind of what I would like to believe a, a culminating perspective uh, to that in developing those survey questions. So that way the, the final national survey that hopefully, you know, everyone gets to see and participate in um, is more representative of the needs of all Americans uh, and is more representative of ways that telehealth can improve and grow and how are people's feelings about like their trust towards telehealth, the security. So it's kind of all the different elements, um, which was really cool. Uh, and I think uh, maybe hopefully will make a really big difference. Well, so um, I am just recently back from six months in Malaysia, uh, and previous to that was six months in Montenegro. So two antipodes of the world. 
experienced and what's striking to me is how similar they are um, and actually similar to the u.s people look the same they dress the same they drive the same cars uh, the atmosphere is quite similar but there are differences that are important but that's for another discussion uh, the idea that what i did was uh, helpful to humanity was a pretty presumptuous idea I mean, if I look back over the six months, the last six months, and the path that I took, uh, was it helpful? Well, I could make good stories about pieces of it, but also I used a lot of energy uh, to do it, a lot of travel, a lot of taking other people's time away from things that they were doing. Uh, so I just don't know the idea that it it's, uh, was helpful to humanity. Now, another line would be that just simply existing contributes to the human condition in a way that's worthwhile, uh, that we all get to do that. And uh, putting standards on it like this was good and that was bad misses the point of what life is really about. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about the issue of social change. And uh, I've been playing, uh, I studied with Eric Fromm. Uh, and Eric Fromm had the idea of social character, which is how an individual's way of being is adapted to a particular society. So it's led me to be thinking recently about how social change requires people who are willing to move into social change, into the, the change itself, and circumstances that support the person making the move. And we don't talk enough about the fact that the circumstances we are in actually precludes our being helpful to humanity. And that's really a difficult thing. But anyway, those are the things that are on my mind and I'm done. So some of you know I had a difficult I had difficulty with this question. I said it last week. There was just something about it. And I really thought about it for a long time. So the quick answer of what I did is I went and I visited my friend who lives in another state, her mother in an assisted living care, because I really wanted to make sure that she was being taken care of okay. But that's really not what I want to talk about, because what struck me when Mike brought up the Gephardt story, and I was thinking how many people are like that, that do things just to hurt other people. It connected to the way I felt when I, when I left the call last week, what really shocked, it, it was nice hearing everybody talk about doing little things, because I think little things are really important. But after listening to everybody talk about how you know, they held the door or how important it is to say thank you and all those really, really important things. I was kind of shocked because I sort of assumed that everybody on this call does those things. It never like, like I, I look at all of you like, of course you guys do those things because we're good people. We do that. There's not a rule that says we have to do this. And yeah, so a lot of my conversations lately have been about religions and how bad it is that we need to codify things to make us be better people and the lines between government and religion. And I try to get people to see how that's not really a good idea. But between last week and this call, I'm thinking maybe we need rules that say, you have to say thank you. You have to hold the door, like all the things that I learned in kindergarten, maybe we do need to make those rules, but not necessarily with a punishment. The punishment is just that we all like stare at you, like, ooh, you didn't do it. But anyway, that that that's my two cents, because like, it, it, it really did surprise me because I'm thinking how many people don't do that? Like, I know there are people like that because I've met them, 
but I don't meet them more than once. So I don't know how many there are like that. Thank you. Yeah, so um, Thanks. moving projects along, thoughtful citizen handbooks, um, of which Jerry wrote a chapter, is uh, looking like it, it, we're, we're getting ready to publish it. <laughs> uh, there's a few more things that need doing, so within the next few months, and essentially it's an ebook that provides the tools for communicating uh, with people that are not like you. Uh, and it, it's about um, how do we become a global citizen uh, in this world at the current time? So that's one piece. One, um, first pass at, at an outline of a book about how um, international um, schools can become one islands of sanity two can plant the seeds of how young people can um create the kind of world that we want to live in going forward um it's a combination of 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 my work and jennifer's work um which is really similar but from two different fields um and i'm kind of excited about the potential um of that one um and um i'm starting to see that the last piece come together in the book i'm working on called getting to relationship which um will be a neo book or distributed in um in some form and and as it's related to to neo book i'm really seeing the potential as i um hit all the things that we need to work on um, on this planet to make it livable. Um, the, the potential for lots of people to make contribution and have it be very much alive is just um, within me in, in the <laughs> sense that, oh, I don't have to do this all by myself. There's lots of people that know a lot more than I do. And as opposed to in an old paradigm where you'd have to go do all this research you can now just open it up to people who know a lot and they can make their contributions and, and let's see where this um, might go. So um, um, this seems to be my full-time job, making contribution. <laughs> and I'm pleased, I'm really pleased to be able to, to you know, um, to do it. And not to mention participating in the call with, with Hank and I'm sure he'll tell tell everybody about his project when when he checks in. Mm -hmm. Well, I was uh, a bit uh, shocked when Jerry sent uh, his email yesterday and saying this was going to be what the check-in was about because I'm doing lots of things which I hope make the world a better place, but who knows? Uh, and you only know afterwards, probably. So I spent the uh, better part of yesterday and today thinking about how I could answer that question. And the best thing I came up with was uh, I very often smile and nod and say hello to people I pass on the street when I pass them. And uh, I mean, I don't, don't want to fall in the trap that Stacy mentioned about, well, you should do that anyway. But at any rate, in, in Amsterdam, where I live, uh, people don't do that so much. Uh, only when they get out into the countryside, it seems that a lot of people do that. So I think uh, 
whether it should be uh, uh, should be something we do naturally or not. Uh, my smiling and nodding and saying hello to people uh, sometimes brings uh, uh, expressions of uh, what's that person doing here? And it sometimes brings an unexpected smile and a nod back. And when it brings the smile and the nod back, I think, well, that sort of is helping to make things better. Uh, and now when, when we've been on the call and I see how a number of other people are interpreting uh, uh, the question, I could talk about the, the project that I'm working on with Stuart that he referred to. I could uh, refer to uh, an article I'm writing, speculating on what the futures of corporate learning could be if corporates change their purposes to being relevant to the rest of the things happening in the world. and. There's a lot of interesting speculation on that, which I hope can get published. Uh, but to be honest, I think uh, smiling and nodding and saying hello to people was my biggest contribution in uh, this week. As far as uh, this week's kind of been different for me because I, I needed to actually focus on my myself more. I mean, I'm my I'm so so driven towards. I mean, the framework I'm developing for my dissertation is about contributions, inspired by Doug Engelbart, and I'm very future focused uh, this um, week. My my dad's back home. Uh, he had uh, been in a rehab center for five weeks, getting his, um, he had broken his leg uh, back in early February and stuff. So I just had to, had to focus on the household, but I just wanted to bring up sometimes we need to do that too and, and take a step back and the self care. And um, then um, I've got, my two major organizations are going to have, we've got a lot, um, both had their conferences in DC this summer. So I'll be um, looking to organize some things. And uh, um, like there's the Democracy Forum I've mentioned before and introduced um, Hank to some people who are involved in that. So just a lot of things like that, but I won't get into, I just wanted to bring up the, that we need self-care in some weeks too. I joined a little bit late, but I'll uh, I'll hop in, uh, and I guess yeah, I'm be on my, I went I had to go back and look on my calendar to see what I did last week, and maybe it's a little bit like like uh, like Hanks. It's like you know, like well, I, I try to do good things most of the time, and uh, uh, I pretty much smile, but you you know, even in Berkeley, people don't pay that much attention. Uh, but uh, but last week was notable because I I left my cocoon of my of my house and family and and Zoom window and went out into the world and participated in events. And I just really haven't done that in, in quite a while. So I was I spent a couple of days at the Bioneers Conference. Uh, I dodged a day, actually. I, I did kind of a day in between there. But, uh, and I did a, a tour of the um, uh, of some of the re uh, uh, sustainability regeneration 
sites in Alameda and uh, the Bay Area, which was really interesting. And then um, went to a slow food meeting at the local, you know, lesbian owned bagel shop uh, and then that they had invested in. Um, and it was kind of like, I'm not exactly sure how that was good to anybody else than me, but uh, it did feel like it was connecting in a different layer and the ideas were, you know, moving around and, the, and it's fun to see people who are so committed to, you know, making the world a better place. I'm, you know, not having to lift it all by myself. Uh, so then it was distinctly different anyway. It was like the, the whole week where I was out outside the, outside the house. I'll jump in. Um, I'm, I'm having a hard time um, this week with that concept, um, with you know the the prompt. In that, um, it was a very odd week because um, my wife got um, quite sick. I mean, you know, not it was a norovirus. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but it's pretty rough and and highly contagious and um we are in a place right now where we're staying in one room um and uh i pretty much had to focus on taking care of her while not um getting sick myself because um she had she had some some she's a choreographer and had a rehearsal scheduled um, in the, that just began and for her to be okay um, and be able to follow through with all the people who were involved um, was important. And she wasn't gonna be there to take care of me this week if I got sick. So, um, so I wasn't doing anything for the world per se but um, I I really was struck by, and and this this sort of speaks to the the multitasking question a little bit. You know, I'm I'm usually spreading myself very thin without any single focus and working on a lot of po projects with a lot of people in a lot of Zoom rooms. Um, but I had to make my paramount focus on her and and our our tiny home um and uh and do a lot of cleaning and do a lot of um you know occasional errands to get the the, the fluids that she might be able to keep down um you know just very a lot of minutia um and and that very simple and focused service work um was kind of kind of freeing in a way. I mean, I didn't feel the sense of the um, juggle and overwhelm that that I usually do in in trying to be involved in a lot of projects. Um, I had to put some things on hold and had to cancel a couple of meetings. Um, and uh, you know, I don't know how much I ended up accomplishing um, for. The rest of the world, um, you know, I, I didn't get to open as many doors as I normally do, um, except for, you know, virtual ones with some forwarded emails and stuff. Um, I didn't get to smile as many people on the street, um, but uh, I learned something that, you know, hopefully will will make me better in, in other weeks to come. All right. I, I put up my hand just as Ken unmuted. And I'm like, ah, right. So I, th I think my contribution to making the world better in the last week was I, I resisted using my death ray to wipe out Toledo. And I think that was a good move. I think just for a minute there, I was like, ah, wouldn't it be fun? I mean, 
imagine the chaos, imagine the, the news is going to make. And then I'm like, nah, let's hold off. So I didn't do that. Um, another very small board good thing. I can notice last week that my voice was a little cranky. Yep, that was a cold coming in the door. And I stayed away from my dojo for a week and uh, tried to not pass it on, et cetera. So I think that was a very tiny thing. I've been I've been trying to figure out how to explain the NeoBooks project simply and clearly, and I'm not anywhere near done with that yet, but I feel like NeoBooks are a contribution toward figuring out how to liberate knowledge and help us um, know what we know and use it better in the world. And then finally, I had a, a first conversation with a startup founder that was really interesting. It's kind of ed tech. And on the one hand, it has a bunch of really lovely uh, things about it, about how to deconstruct knowledge. It's kind of neo booky in spirit. And on the other hand, it had gamification and a couple of other things I'm not really very fond of. Uh, and, and you know, uh, a, a deal with a really major educational publisher that I'm kind of suspicious of was was in the in the works and all that. And so I think in the conversation, I may have influenced the direction of the startup a little bit, which happens a bunch when I talk to startups. It's like, oh, have you considered this? What about that? Um, so I think that was my other small bore um, contribution toward um, making the world a tiny bit better. Thank you. Well, you just saw my, uh, I held the door for Jerry. So that was my contribution for the week. Um, that's... <laughs> Um, like Hank, I, I walk around my neighborhood. I say hi to everybody I see. And sometimes people like look at me like, you know, you saying hi to me. And, you know, sometimes I have to say hi 20, 30 times and they'll start to go, oh, hello. You know, um, I don't take it personal when people don't say hi back or they look weird at me because they're in their own world and who knows what's going on there, you know, and, and, you know, maybe they've had bad experiences with strange men saying hello to them. I don't know, but I, it, it doesn't dissuade me. I just keep smiling and saying hello to folks and, I've actually gotten to know a lot of people in my neighborhood um, as a result of that. And I've I've also gotten to know people in my neighborhood through their animals. Because I, you know, I always stop and I say to the dog, did you want to say hi? You know, <laughs> and the dog comes over and um, they say, oh, you're so nice. I'm like, I love dogs and, and cats, but I can't have them in my apartment. So this is where I get my dog love. And I always thank them for, you know, letting me pet their dog, whatever. Um, actually, I, I carry dog treats with me when I go hiking on the trails and I... I always ask, is it okay to give your dog a treat? And this one one said, please don't, because if you do, she'll go home with you and not me. And I thought that was just really funny. You know, like she'll sell you out for a biscuit, right? Um, so that's just and this whole conversation got me reflecting, you know, I was a Boy Scout and I wasn't a particularly great scout. I made it to second class. I wasn't, I was just there a couple of years. I didn't become an eagle or anything, but but I still remember a scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, ob Obedience, always, I never did obedience very well, but cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. And I found those to be really valuable um, values to hold on to. And, um, you know, when I see somebody struggling, uh, like when my wife and I first met, we were walking through Cambridge. I was living in Boston. And I, I look down the, the street and I, I see a guy in a wheelchair trying to get up over the curb. And he couldn't do it. And I walked over. He was an older, older guy. At the time, I was in my early 30s and he was probably in his 60s and I walked over and I helped him up you know and I started to push his wheelchair and then I noticed he's homeless you know he's, he's had dirt packed in his hair and stuff and I'm just talking to him you know and I brought him down to the the tea station and got him on the elevator and the wife looked at me and said I can't believe you did that for a homeless person I was like I didn't see a homeless person I saw an old man struggling and if I'm an old man in a wheelchair I hope somebody will do the same for me if I'm struggling you know so I just, it's my basic stance to try and be kind whenever I can. And, you know, hopefully, as they say, kindness is always possible, right? So um, I, I don't try to make a big deal of it. It's just if I see somebody who needs some help, I try to lend a hand. And um, I don't really think about it. Oh, I'm trying to make the world better. I'm just, this is how I was raised. Um, I, I saw a woman at Costco struggling to lift a, a thing of bottled water out of for the the cart. She was an older woman. I said, "Can I help you with that?" You know, I've learned to ask. I used to just go over and it's because somebody's like, "No, I want to do this myself." You know, um, but just trying to the the daily little things like this, I think, are really important glue in our culture 
And I, it was actually April, um, Jerry's wife, April posted something during the pandemic about how, because people were staying home, a lot of the glue was falling apart and there's just saying hello to your barista, you know, how you doing? Good to see you again. How's your day going? You know, these little things actually make a huge difference in the way that, that people feel throughout the day. So, um, I don't think about it. Just, it's just who I am and how I do. Um, and I have a friend who's, I met him in, in eighth grade back in 1970, and we've been together for 54 years now and still friends. And we talk every week and he's a scientist and very reductionistic and, and very cranky and very pessimistic about the world. And we always talk about the world and I'm constantly trying to get him to see, you know, you're making a set as if anybody's read Plex today, Gil said a thing on moods. He's always like the world is going to hell. And it's, I'm very pessimistic. And, and I said, you know, I'm pessimistic too in that, there's a lot of really bad things that are happening that are going to continue to happen because of the inertia in the system, but I can't let that stop me from doing whatever I can to, to undo and, and redo things so that they're not so bad. Cause as we get closer and closer to that narrowing of the funnel, I want to keep it as wide as possible. So people who make it to the other side will have more of what makes life worthwhile. And I think he's, moves towards resignation a lot. Like there's nothing I can do and it's hopeless. And so my battle every week with him is to get him to see it's not hopeless and don't be resigned. Do what you can, even if it's just to say hello to somebody on the street, that that's actually a big contribution to the world. So that's how I'm going about trying to make the world a little bit better or am I having been here. Thanks, Ken. I believe that makes a complete round, which is unusual. It's not at the top of the hour and we've touched everybody. We didn't do a lot of pausing, which means, Carl, it's groovy for you to come in, which means I'm releasing the hounds on the chat uh, and we can find our way to whatever we want to talk about for the next half hour. So, Carl, the floor is yours. Okay, yeah, just uh, kind of a good segue then because there were people who weren't on the call last week, but I had brought up that uh, the I, I wanted to ask, I'm trying to remember, Mike had brought up um, when I was looking at a, doing a paper a couple of years ago. I had, um, we talked about the microaggressions and stuff, but I had identified uh, micro inclusions is kind of what I had with DEI. And then um, when I did a search, there was one paper from Brazil and Portuguese that was using it in that context. Everything else was about imperfections and diamonds and stuff. Um, but yeah, then I brought up the thing about that I had held. Um, I had, a, um, I'm in DC, there was a Juan Valdez coffee shop in the Organization of American States building. And I had a um, black man who's probably mid 60s. Um, uh, insist on buying me a cup of coffee because I was the first white man who had ever held the door open for me. So that was um, kind of the context there. I, the one one regret is I should have really, it's like we were, everybody's in such a rush, I should have really engaged him and found out more about his life experience. If I could do it over again, I would. that's what I would have done. What strikes me in listening this morning is uh, the stress on basically civility and good manners as being a core. And it reminds me that Confucius came into prominence in China during what was called the Warring States period. Uh, and he proposed basically that if we stressed manners and civility and ritual, in ways of dealing with each other, it could cut through the war stuff. And it strikes me that we're in the, uh, the contrast was with Lao Tzu uh, and a more Zen-like way of being in the world. And both, of course, are attractive paths for us. But I think we're saying that right now, the civility path is the more important. Yeah. It's a little bit like 
broken windows theory, kind of. I mean, the, the idea is, hey, if you get into a neighborhood and you see graffiti and broken windows, you're more likely to commit other kinds of crimes or feel like oversight or care in the neighborhood is lax and you can do more and do worse. And I'm I'm unclear whether broken windows theory has proven itself or not. And certainly it was connected to a bunch of other strange uh, policy behavior. But it's the civic scale of the interpersonal stuff that we're talking about right now, which is, you know, acts of kindness and and civility and courtesy among people just with with one another. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, just a couple of questions. I um, sent Dave, a, a, once the curfew on, on chat was lifted, I sent Dave a question about his conference, so maybe we can follow up offline. But my main question was for Doug Carmichael. Uh, 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 I got to go to Malaysia twice in the last year and a half and speak at a, some global conferences there, and but also interact a lot with the digerati of Malaysia. I'd love to hear another minute or two on on your perceptions of Malaysia. I, I I've come away quite impressed, um, particularly how they they have decentralized a lot of uh, policy making, and so there's a real competition between the provinces. I got to go to both Penang and to Sarawak. Uh, I did not spend time in Malaysia, so I, I'd love to hear your perceptions and how the different parts of the country uh, are, are different and, and what we can learn from Malaysia. Because we, we, we've we been very impressed. We've been doing some analysis of what they're trying to do. And uh, for, for 20 years, actually for 20 years ago, 25 years ago, they had the vision. And for 15 years, that's all about all they had. And they had a bunch of investment from foreign tech companies. But now they seem to actually be implementing, and they have a lot of talent. So it, it, it's it's I'd be investing if I could. Well, let me say a few things about that. Uh, I was really struck by first how similar Malaysia felt to me to the being in the states, as I said earlier. But the differences are also profound, and that is, uh, people struck me as basically happier basically healthier. Uh, there's very little fast food uh, and people are suntanned, of course, because of the climate. Uh, but the general feeling of well-being is really quite striking and it's truly a multicultural state. Uh, many people speak four languages, uh, English, Chinese, the two Chinese uh, uh, languages and Malaysian. And uh, it, there's a, that mix that just is treated in a positive way for, by most people most of the time. And I felt that the, generally they're more open. It, their mind is more like a sieve than a vault. Hmm. Uh, stuff comes in and goes out more easily than it does here. Uh, we are more uptight for sure. Uh, and I find it really striking that there are dangers of uh, the multiculturalism could lead to uh, uh, civil war at some point, especially with re problems with resources. Uh, but generally, I love being there. I uh, had a really good time. I felt uh, supported and stimulated. And the food and the coffee are amazing. Yes. Living. The worst thing in Malaysia is the traffic. Uh, in Penang, last, which is a kind of province, uh, 33,000 new cars were registered in the last six months of the year. And we're going to put them. I mean, there's already a, an, an intense traffic jam in the whole place. I'm going to take us back to the conversation of civility because I thought it was uh, really interesting, and I uh, maybe wanted to throw uh, an idea into the group because you know I don't know Stacy mentioned early on um, there's this feeling and we're all doing these kind things we're you know smiling to our neighbors we're saying hello and it almost feels like you wish you could codify some of these things that like not law but like you know like Stacy said like wish there was something a little bit more tangible to ensuring that that got done. Um, and it got me thinking 
uh, as somebody that's doing, you know, I do a lot of public health, I do a lot of public policy, and we have a lot of focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, DEI, um, that some of those steps can be a really slippery slope, right? Like, you know, I, what I think of, you know, there's there's the you know, smile to your neighbor, but how, you know, how wide of a net we ca um, cast that we define as civility, some of those things can be cultural. For instance, you know, we say we be, we're, we're quiet and respectful in public places. Quietness and respect is not necessarily a thing in other non-Caucasian cultures. You know, there's, um, you know, a lot, there's an assumption that somebody's being aggressive if they're black when they're really just being loud because that's part of their community, that's part of their culture. It's not, you know, it, it's misidentified or it's misrepresented in uh, different cultures. And I think I really enjoy this conversation of civility, um, but I think it's, it, it needs to be had alongside that multicultural discussion of how do we encourage kindness to each other without uh, excluding cultures because we are associating kindness as certain behaviors that maybe don't um, aren't the same representatively across cultures. I hope that made sense. Totally, thanks, Lizzie. Um, Stacy, please. Thank you. And, and I'll just add, you know, being a woman, you also can't always smile without having it taken the wrong way. So you have to be careful with that too. Um, what I wanted to say after Doug had spoken though, is that part of what set me, I mean, I, I really thought about the question for at least a day. And my experience was more like, I felt like, so the reason I didn't like the question, which I stated last week, is I felt like we were asked to come here and say how great we are. What did we do that was so great? And that is really hard for me. I'm not somebody that's good at, like, I'm, I'm, it's just hard for me. What made this question hard for me is that when I thought about the things that I do, they all felt so little. And I feel like this society has taught me not to value those little things. And I think that's a big piece of this. Um, and then for, I don't know why I'm adding this, but I guess in some way this connects to the commons and where I think I wanna be able to help. I started thinking about Bob Hope <laughs> and the service that he provided. And that that is such an important role. And somehow, and this is more of a neo booky kind of conversation and goes with some of our other community calls. I think we, I would love if some of us could develop something for the commons that's almost like an entertainment piece. And I don't mean entertaining, I mean more engaging piece. So like which, an OGM USO tour. Well, you know what? It's like this call has pieces of it. You know, other calls have pieces of it, almost like an OGM variety talk show. That 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 that's what I'm thinking. So anyway, um I just I just wanted to point out that part of what we what we say we value is not built into the system to be valued. And I think we should put a little thought into that and if there's something we can do to shift that. Thank you. Thanks, Stacey. I'm I'm sure at least one of our regular viewers on YouTube is watching us for the comedy and for <laughs> Ken's poems at the end. <clears throat> yeah, we could do this as nerd criteria. I like it. <laughs> Ken, please. So I just wanted to respond to something that Lizzie said. Of, um, anybody here see The Color of Fear? The movie The Color of Fear? Okay, it's a documentary about uh, a bunch of men, people of color uh, on a weekend retreat. And it's a pretty intense documentary. And Victor Lewis was um, one of the most intense people on there. I found myself, uh, he's, he's a black man from Oakland, I believe. I found myself at a conference with him. Uh, Deep Ecology Summer Schools, uh, 1994, so 30 years ago. And um, there's people, you know, uh, faculty members speaking and Victor going, yeah, 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 
reach. Yeah, yeah. And I went up to him later. I said, you know, I really find you rude. He's like, oh, dude, thank you for telling me that. You got to know where I come from. I listen loudly. My people listen loudly. When we go to church, people say something good. We'll go, yeah, preach. We want to hear it. That's the way I appreciate what I hear. And I said, wow, thank you for telling me that. Because it was so eye-opening that I had this, my filter of my culture says you sit quietly and respectfully. You know, like at a, I'm a jazz lover, you know, and when I, when someone does something great in jazz, everybody applauds, you know, but this is, no, you're in you're a classical concert here. You, you hold your applause to the end. And I just, I got this deep appreciation for, for the honesty that passed between us. And also the fact that, he wasn't being disrespectful. He was, he was actually being hugely respectful. And I didn't ever occur to me that that was the case. So um, I'm grateful I got that lesson fairly early in my life because it's really helped me to open up to, to recognize when someone does something that I have a judgment about to inquire, you know, why are you doing that? And it's like, oh, okay, thanks for letting me know. I really appreciate that. Just wanted to thank you, Lizzie, for, for triggering that memory for me. Well, just our astonishingly different um i know in in latin america generally i'm probably overgeneralizing anyway if i'm if you're talking to someone and they're not going aha uh -huh, yeah got it in the spanish equivalents vale see si. if they're not giving you a little act back periodically it's like they're not listening and in in our rounds here when we talk we all go into respectful silence until a person is finished saying what they say right and i think to some people from other cultures it's like talking into a void like like there's an anechoic chamber out here is anybody even alive out there um and that rhythm gives them more trigger and more energy to participate continue putting their energy into the conversation and i think we're seldom aware of all these things i know that uh, long ago i read that in iranian culture if when you see somebody who's iranian you don't ask after their family it's kind of insulting and and you know, like when, when you meet, like, how's your mom? You know, uh, how are the kids? Whatever. Like the first thing you do is tend to the family. And again, I may be missing broadly, but we don't notice stuff like that. And we're we're sort of making passing insults in ways that people don't comment on because they've given up. They're, they're like, ah, nobody knows that about me slash us. Uh, so I won't bother. But inside, there's a little wound of some sort. So it's interesting to just be alert to the different manifold ways that humans exist on the planet and the things that we have as expectations and cultural norms and <clears throat> fears and all those kinds of things. One of my closest friends is a man from Morocco. He's 84 now. He's born, you know, in the Atlas Mountains in a dirt Ford hut, you know, and, and he's always saying you in his culture, exactly what Jerry said, you always ask, how's your wife? How are your children? How's your parents? You know, that was just, that was how conversation was done before you ever got to anything about yourself. And um, I, I just, I find it's a, a lovely thing. You know, he's, he says, you know, how's your wife? Or he says, how's the baby? You know, like it's just, and if I don't ask after his wife and his kids, then he, he won't say anything, but I know he'll be upset with me. So I've learned to always say, you know, how's your grandchildren? And that's your, it's just, and again, this comes back to some kind of the, the glue that holds us together. It's not earth shattering. It's very mundane, but it's very important that we do it because it really, you know, makes people feel that you're interested and you, you're you seeing them and acknowledging them. And I think that's so many people that I, I see out there don't feel seen. And I think of Michael Mead when he was asked, you know, what do you think about cameras being installed in schools? He said, children don't want to be looked at. They want to be seen. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Lizzie, and we have a cue going. Yeah, I was just going to say really quick, it feels like we're in a conversation of an, you know, instead of a culture of civility, but a culture of good intention. You know, if I'm walking into a person and I, I know that however they're coming towards me is with kindness and with, you know, warmth and with welcome, I can interpret that however it comes. That was, that was just my two cents that was sitting in my head. Nothing too big. Thank you. That's great. Um, that, was, that was actually perfect because I couldn't find the words for it. And that is exactly what I was thinking. I mean, one of the things I don't like about rules is that they're constantly changing and you can't always know what set of rules you're walking into. 
And so to me, it's about the good intention, but the, uh, the other piece is the authenticity. I don't like when somebody asks me a bunch of questions that they think they should ask. You know, like, I don't like small talk. I just, I want to be with somebody and whatever comes out, comes out, but it's with knowing that there's good intention behind it. You know, and let's face it, there are some people that no matter what you do, they're going to see the negative in it. And you can't change that. So uh, thank you, Lizzie. That was perfect. <laughs> Um, at the risk of peeing in the punch bowl, uh, I want to point out the obvious, which is that shattering civility and civil norms are what MAGA is all about. And as a, as a tactic, as a strategy, in fact, to froth up opponents and get them unsettled and out of their zone, comfort zone, and in fact, in a fearful zone to shut down their options and their planning and everything else. And it works. It works beautifully. So what I've got a, a thought in my brain that's like a Trump's playbook, basically the tactics that Trump uses all the time and breaking norms. Uh, and I, I, I'm not sure I have being uncivil in there, but I will attach it now. That's that's in fact something he does regularly as a matter of course, to own the political dialogue, to get attention, because he knows in modern politics, in modern power politics, that all attention is good. There's no such thing as bad attention. When, when somebody's hating on you, if you look powerful as somebody walks by the CNN monitor, um, it's a win for you. And his followers seem to agree with that. And it's turning into the taking apart of civility and all the things that we've talked about nicely in our conversational part of this call. And it distresses me no end because I love cultural norms, that, especially when they're good. I love civility. I love kindness. I think all those things are awesome. And we're in, an, in a moment now where those things are being weaponized very intentionally, and that makes me deeply sad. Um, and I, I don't think that means we stop doing those things with one another. In fact, I think it, what it might mean is that those things matter more in a time of aggression and conflict and, you know, all, all these kinds of things. But, but and I'll add one last thought, which is uh, the the accusation of snowflake uh, was popular maybe five, six years ago from the right to the left. And then I will say that the right is now acting like snowflakes. Uh, they're sensitive about everything, about like what, whatever, and they, they can't seem to take it. But that's a whole separate conversation. Anyway, um, on to Mike, Stacy, then Doug. Once again, we're going to run out of time just as we're getting into the deep, big issues. Um, just real quickly, I'm going to use uh, a virtual PowerPoint to, to draw this Venn diagram. Um, oh, that's right. The world's best Venn diagram. Yes. And I, I will send a link to the whole group. But um, up in the top corner, it, it said Reagan, senile. Then it had another circle overlapping Bush, incompetent. And then overlapping with both was Putin, autocratic. And then the three-way connection, Trump. And it was just like, wow. <laughs> That's nice. If you haven't seen the articles just in the last 24 hours on prominent psychologists saying Trump will be completely in, uh, senile within four years, I mean, it, it's it may be the thing we have to get people to understand that we have to talk to our 60 year old friends and say, you've got an 85 year old father and you, you've mentioned he's not thinking real clearly. That's what we're seeing. I mean, the, 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 if you watch, if you just sit and watch 10 minutes of his speeches lately, they're just, they're, they're nonsensical, but that's the negative. Let me change the topic just a little bit and talk about how we find common ground. Has anybody seen the chart of Airbnb bookings in America for Sunday night? It's a map of the US, all these blue dots where people still have rooms available and there's a red streak across the, 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 the nation 
where everybody has booked their Airbnb for the eclipse. There's mm. nobody, no place to rent, or at least no Airbnbs. I'm going to go up to Erie, Pennsylvania. I have friends flying to Ohio and, and, and Tennessee and Texas. Here's an, an event that people of all political persuasions, old and young, are going to find you know, really life-changing, or at least it's going to be, you know, something they never forget. Uh, I saw Jerry in, in Oregon about seven years ago when Lizzie and I went down to see the eclipse. And it was, it was the perfect place, the perfect time. And I'm hoping, hoping, hoping that we don't have any clouds in Erie, Pennsylvania. And I'm hoping, hoping that the place we've picked to hang out, which is a relatively small city park, they're going to have a uh, 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 Pink Floyd cover band <laughs> playing songs from uh, uh, Dark Side of the Moon and, and food trucks. And I'm hoping to just talk to people about what this experience means and to you know forget about everything else that's going on in the world. It, it should be a, a, a very special time. I mean, we saw the last eclipse at a, at a Christian school where my um, cousin's husband taught. Again, very different culture and politics than Lizzie and I, but it was it was a community just entranced by the spectacle of the lights going out at uh, at one o'clock in the afternoon. So the key, I think, is to get yourself into a really serious conversation about important issues so that you can make a claim that, yes, the sun will go away at a particular moment to win your argument, but you have to time <laughs> it. You have to time the whole thing just right. So you are like old priests of, you know, what, thousands, a couple hundred thousand years ago? Uh, totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. You figured it out. I mean, it, works, it, 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 it beats, works for the Egyptian priests. You know, it, the river would rise when they said it would. It beats virgin sacrifice. Gotta say. A lot of, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Big time. <laughs> um, Doug, over, over to you. Well, I forgot what I was. No. <laughs> use the chat yeah. as your. You should have put it in the chat. <laughs> yeah, I sometimes use the chat as a, as my little reminder zone. <clears throat> so, so I'm gonna pass. I like it. Best if 2016 April Fools, Carl. Man. Yeah, that was yeah the first <laughs> and the Trump, but yeah, I love that. You know, I, I'm looking forward to seeing Trump in orange, but I'm not sure that's the orange I'm thinking of. <laughs> uh, so there's also a, there's also orange a, that's yeah, saffron. There's also a pantone, a pantone, uh, pantone color of um, clownfish orange. I love that, uh, Stacy. Then Doug. Yeah, Zoom had taken my hand down. I just had two quick things to say. One, to you know, as far as the MAGA comment. I just want to say that extremes are like that. You know, there are people on the extreme left and they are so not civil. And I think just the best thing we could do is to just be even more civil to whoever we're talking to. And that that's one of the things I really do try to do every single day. And there was something else, but I don't remember what it is other than don't laugh. There are tons of people that are doing religious things and and staying home and expecting crazy stuff to happen as a result of this eclipse. So like we're laughing right now, but this talked about like mass delusion and hysteria and whatnot. This is and I'm sure somebody delusion. out there is using it to their benefit. Exactly. This has happened so often in the past. It's kind of crazy. Uh, Doug, then Hank, then Dave. So go oh, ahead. I remember what I was going to say. Oh, Which good. That people like us, I think, are on an, an obligation to understand Trump's, Trump supporters a little better. A key thing is this society at the level of ec economics and or culture is not working for them. And they're deeply motivated by that. And we need to understand it. I agree with you entirely. I'm pasting in the chat the thoughts I've been collecting since I created this thought in 2016. Why do people support Trump? 
And I think there's a lot of good reasons why people support Trump, a lot of very legit reasons that we don't, that we understand that we forget at our peril. And Stacey, thanks for pointing out that the far left and, and the right's beef against cancel culture and microaggressions and all that kind of stuff is exactly that. It's like, hey, guess what? Y'all are trying to shut us down uh, from even conversing. So, uh, Hank. You're muted. Sorry, uh, we're coming to the end of our time. So I just wanted to say out loud something I just put into the chat. I really like this developing theme of a culture of civility and uh, small kindnesses and good intentions and assuming good intentions. Uh, because you tend to forget, or at least I'll do it personally, I tend to forget sometimes that that should be natural and uh, it should be more of it. So uh, I don't want to say we should have this type of check-in every week or every month, but I think uh, it'd be very useful for people on this call and people like us to think about how that can be cultivated. And I just want to make one comment about Stacy, what you said a few minutes ago, the things I do, they all seem so small and I have exactly the same thing, but now listening to everything said here and about the small kindnesses and the, the, the other things like that, I'm, I'm getting to appreciate the importance of small things. Thanks, Hank. Dave. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks, Jake. Yeah, I was kind of, Stacey, you provoked me thinking uh, around the left-right kind of notion of like what people on the left are doing, people on the right are doing. And I was listening to, to Tyler Cohen talk with some woman who was doing a biography of, uh, of Milton Friedman, and they were using the left-right kind of analysis. And it struck me that that analysis is fundamentally wrong today. I'm just throwing this in here at the end of the session. Maybe somebody can respond to it later. That it's not a it's not a line with the left and right. It's actually a circle, probably a spiral, even right. And 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 one of the things we're doing with by keeping going back to the left right analysis is that we're missing that there's we've moved on into other spaces that we're not talking about anymore. So we're trying to understand Trump in a left right kind of framework, but he doesn't really fit there. You know, he's somewhere else. And I think um, like a lot of the, you know, in my world around regeneration, the kind of progressive, you know, regenerative agriculture people run right into the um, ivermectin taking, um, you, know, in, in, you know, imprisoned Fauci people. They're the, they overlap kind of there. And then they start to look really MAGA. But, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's a circle, I, I swear. Anybody and it, it matters, you know, that it's not a lie. It's a circle. So I interrupt you. Uh, anybody who's nope. found an article that describes more productive dimensions or dimensionality or ways of talking about this, please share those on the OGM list or here or whatever. Um, I think that's really important that we stop using the same, the same sort of tropes, metrics, framing uh, that we've been using because it's it's failing us. If Thanks, I could Dave. just jump in real quick and just please. say to what Dave said, we we have to recognize that there's a difference between the ivermectin crowd and the jail Fauci crowd. Those two are not the same. They overlap, but they are not the same. And as far as like the jail Fauci crowd, I don't know that you can talk to all of them. I don't, you know, it depends. Within each of those things, there are some that cannot be spoken to. That go, But that goes with all things, with all politics, with all beliefs. There's always going, to, and that's why I always say, I try to get, get a baseline of how people make decisions. And if they change depending on who they're talking to, then I know it's a lost cause. Mm -hmm. So why waste my time there? And I mean, Stacey, my, one of my examples is it's the Organic Consumers Association, right? Which is the big organic association has the regenerative agriculture group, which is, you know, the big regenerative agriculture group. And they're calling, and the people in that organization are publicly calling for Fauci to be in prison. And it's like, whoa, I don't know what to do. Ah. Wrap around. Yeah. And just to say real quick, in that case, ask que what I do is I ask questions because then people could see, well, that's kind of harsh or, well, why do you think that, you know, just so that we see who we're standing next to. 
I think it's important. Thanks, Stacey. Thanks for putting the big smelly fish on the table at the end of our conversation, Dave. Um, Brother Homer, do you have a poem for us to take us out of this very nice call? In honor of the eclipse, I'm going to read Theodore Rothke's In a Dark Time. In a dark time, the eye begins to see. I meet my shadow in the deepening shade. I hear my echo in the echoing wood, a ward of nature weeping to a tree. I live between the heron and the wren, beasts of the hill and serpents of the den. What's madness but nobility of soul at odds with circumstance? This is my favorite line of this poem. What is madness but nobility of soul at odds with circumstance? The day's on fire. I know the purity of pure despair. My shadow pinned against a sweating wall. That place among the rocks. Is it a cave or a winding path? The edge is what I have. A steady storm of correspondences. A night flowing with birds, a ragged moon, and in broad daylight, the midnight come again. A man goes far to find out what he is, the death of the self in a long, tearless night, all natural shapes blazing, unnatural light. Dark, dark my light, and darker my desire. My soul, like some heat-maddened summer fly, keeps buzzing at the sill. Which I is I? A fallen man, I climb out of my fear. The mind enters itself, and God, the mind, and the one is one, free in the tearing wind. Thank you, Ken. Thanks very much. Um, anybody who's going to go see the eclipse, have a great time on Monday. Um, it's funny, uh, there's an Aikido seminar in Montreal uh, led by one of the founders of my dojo here in Portland. I'm not attending, but five of my dojo mates are going and they had to book early because the city was booking up because Eclipse. So they're going to, most of them are going to hang out through Monday uh, to see it and recover. 75% chance of clouds in Montreal. Ah, that sucks. Apparently Pike's Peak is prime viewing. No, is it off center? Shoot. Yeah. No, it's way. That's way west. It's, Don't it's go to Pikes Peak. It's only eighty percent. Eighty percent coverage. Don't go to Pikes Peak. Never mind that. Pikes. What's the Aikido Some move against clouds, here. Jerry? I there's not much you can do. It. I, I think it's it's this. Yeah, I got a friend. Wave really hands in clouds. Yeah, Lizzie, thanks for being with us. Nice to meet you, Lizzie. Really Come back it. again. Thanks, Lizzie. Oh, she disappeared. So don't forget to be awesome, everybody. DFTBA. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the nerd fighter nerd fighter motto. Even the Little Scout motto. <laughs> bye. Bye bye. Thanks, y'all. Take care.